If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for the privilege of being in your presence. And as we study today about the dead who stand before God, we ask that you will give us divine wisdom that we might be able to understand in what sense the dead do stand before God. There's much misunderstanding in the Christian world today about many of these verses. And I ask, Lord, that as people watch this presentation, that you will remove every preconceived idea and notion from their minds and hearts, that they might see the truth as it is in Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, we are going to study today about the dead who stand before God. This uh, is a verse that we find in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. But we're not going to go there first. We're going to go first of all to several other concepts that will set the stage for us to understand that particular verse. The first thing that I want us to notice is a few things about the pre-advent judgment. You see, the Bible teaches that there's going to be a judgment before the second coming of Jesus. And it is the righteous who are going to be judged before Jesus comes. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14 and verses 6 and 7. What I want you to notice here is that the judgment begins before the second coming of Jesus. That's the point that I want us to notice from this uh, passage in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. It says there, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment will come. Oh, thank you very much. I was hoping that some of you would protest. Because there is no Bible that I know of that says, for the hour of His judgment will come. It says, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Obviously, this is speaking about a judgment that takes place before the second coming of Jesus. And you say, how do we know that? Because in Revelation 14, after this message, we have two more. We have the second angel's message calling God's people out of Babylon. And we have the third angel's message warning people about the mark of the beast and warning about worshiping the image of the beast. So you'll notice here it says the judgment has come, but after the announcement that the judgment has come, you still have the second message and the third message, and then you have the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the hour of God's judgment begins before the second coming of Jesus when the first angel proclaims his message. Now the question is, where does that judgment take place? Go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10. And the point that I want us to notice from this particular passage is that the judgment takes place in heaven. It says there in Daniel 7, 9 and 10, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. That's God the Father. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of His head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before Him. A thousand thousands ministered to Him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before Him. The court was seated and the books were opened. 
question, where is this judgment taking place? Very clearly in heaven, where the Ancient of Days is found. That's where God the Father is. And we're told here that a thousand thousands ministered to Him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before Him. Those are the angels. In other words, in heaven is where the court is seated and the books are opened. So we've noticed two things so far about the judgment. Number one, the judgment begins before the second coming of Jesus. Number two, that judgment takes place in heaven, not in earth. Now let's notice one other point which is very, very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. This is a very well-known verse, probably you've read it many, many times, and the point that I want us to get from this verse is that all of us, without exception, will have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to render an account for what we did during our life. Notice 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How many must appear in the judgment? All. Notice, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So what is determined when people appear before the judgment seat of Christ? What is determined is the reward they are going to receive depending on what they did while they lived in the body. We've already noticed that that means while they lived on this earth with this mortal, corruptible body that we have. Now I would like to notice along with you John 5, 28 and 29. We're going to answer a very important question here. Where do the dead go until the moment of the resurrection? Go with me to John 5, 28 and 29. And the point that I want you to get from this particular passage, John 5, 28 and 29, is that when a person dies, they go to the grave until Jesus comes to call them forth from the grave. Notice, John 5, 28 and 29. Here Jesus is speaking. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now the question is, when will people receive their reward? Do they receive their reward when they die, supposedly, and go to heaven? Or when they die and supposedly go to hell? Or do people receive their rewards when Jesus comes? The Bible is very, very clear that people receive their rewards when Jesus comes. Notice Matthew 16 and verse 27. Matthew 16 and verse 27 tells us very clearly when people will receive their reward. Here Jesus is speaking once again and He says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. When will people receive their rewards? It's at the moment when Jesus comes with His angels. It is not at the moment when people die. People don't go to heaven. They don't go to hell when they die. They will be rewarded when Jesus comes. Now let's review what we've studied so far. Number one, the judgment of the righteous, particularly, begins before the second coming of Jesus. Point number two, that judgment takes place where? The judgment takes place in heaven. Number three, how many must appear? Everyone must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Point number four, where are people until the moment when they receive their reward? They are in the grave. And when is it that they will receive the reward? When Jesus comes with all of His holy angels. Now immediately we ask this question which is very important. If those who are in their graves receive their reward when Jesus comes, must they have been judged before to determine what their reward was going to be? Absolutely yes. 
Now the question is, how did they appear before the judgment seat of Christ before Jesus came if they were dead? Are you understanding my question? The Bible says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment takes place before the second coming in heaven. How can a person who died in Christ appear before the judgment seat of Christ in heaven before Jesus comes to reward them? Are you understanding my question? The answer is simple. The righteous who died in Jesus do not appear before the judgment seat of Christ in person alive, but they appear before the judgment seat of Christ through the records that were kept of their lives. In other words, they stand before the throne of Jesus Christ, not in person, because they're in their graves. They stand before the judgment seat of Christ through the records that were kept while they were living in the body. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to have a body when Jesus comes. In the body means in this present earthly, corruptible, mortal existence. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now allow me to read you a couple of interesting statements from the book The Great Controversy written by Ellen White where she explains how the righteous will appear before the judgment seat of Christ if they're dead, if they're in their graves, if they're not rewarded till Jesus comes. Notice Great Controversy, page 483. She says this, As the books of record are opened in the judgment, what's opened in the judgment? The books of record. The lives, notice this, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. What is it that is, that is examined in the judgment? She says, as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. How are people then standing before the judgment seat of Christ? They're not standing there personally. They are standing there through their records. Are you following what I'm saying? This is extremely important for what we're going to study in Revelation 20 and verse 12. Notice the second statement is in Great Controversy, page 482 the page immediately before the, where I read from. The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment. Is that point clear from what we've studied? The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment, at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. What is it that determines that the righteous dead are worthy of the resurrection of life? It's the fact that their life is examined beforehand and the reward is meted out to be given to them when they're resurrected. Then she says this, and I'll begin at the beginning of the statement again. The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. Hence, here comes the key portion, Hence, they will not be present in person at the tribunal when their records are examined and their cases decided. In other words, they are not going to be there in person. They appear before the judgment seat of Christ through the records of their lives. Raise your hands if you're understanding what I'm saying. Very, very well. A hundred percent. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 6 and verses 15 through 17. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 17, uh, 15 through 17. By the way, we've already spoken about the judgment of the righteous. They're in their graves. Uh, they're judged worthy of life before Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, He gives them their reward at the second coming. But now we're going to talk about the wicked. What happens with the wicked? Notice Revelation 6 and verses 15 through 17. 6, 15 through 17. Then the sky, and there's key words that I'm going to underline here that I want you to remember. The sky, or heaven, receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. This is speaking about the second coming of Jesus. What happened with the sky? The sky receded as a scroll. In other words, the sky disappeared. And it says every island and every mountain were what? Moved out of their places. In other words, they weren't found anymore. 
Notice verse 15, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the, I want you to remember this word, from the face of him who sits on the throne, remember the word throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Question, what great event is being described in these verses? There's no doubt whatsoever that it's describing the second coming of Jesus. What happens at the second coming of Jesus? The sky recedes as a scroll. In other words, the sky is rolled up and disappears. Every mountain and every island are moved out of their places, which means that they are no longer what? Found. And then the wicked cry, hide us from the what? From the face of the one who is seated on the throne. Now, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 picks up on this scene of Revelation chapter 6. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Revelation 20 and verse 11. This verse is describing the same thing as Revelation 6, 15 through 17. This verse is describing, in other words, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Notice Revelation 20 and verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne. Was there a throne in the passage that we just read? Absolutely. I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose, did we find the word face in the other passage? Yes. From whose face, what happened? Earth and heaven, what? Fled away. Did we notice that in Revelation 6? Sure. And now notice, and there was found no what? No place for them. The very same word that's used in Revelation chapter 6. So what is being described in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11? What's being described is the same thing as in Revelation 6, 15 through 17. It is the second coming of Jesus in power and glory. Let me ask you, at this time, who receives their rewards? The righteous. Do the wicked receive their rewards yet at this moment? No. The righteous receive their rewards. Jesus says that He's going to give His reward when He comes with His angels for His people. But the question is, what about the wicked when Jesus comes? Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. Here's our key verse that we're studying in our topic today. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. What has just taken place? Let me ask you, what has just taken place according to what we just noticed? The second coming of Jesus, right? Now I want you to notice in verse 12, the very next verse, something very interesting. It says, And I saw the dead. Wh which dead? Which dead do you think these are? The righteous dead? No. Let's continue reading. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. You say, now wait a minute, how can dead people stand before God? He saw the dead, standing before God. Is this after the second coming in the previous verse? Absolutely. And now notice, and books were opened. And another book was opened. Notice, books and book. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And now notice, and the dead. By the way, were these people dead? Yeah, it says, I saw the dead standing before God. And it says, the dead were what? Were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the what? In the books. Now, two questions beg to be asked. Number one. How can dead people stand before God? Before God's judgment bar. Question number two. Who are these dead that are spoken of in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12? The answers to these two questions will clarify what it means when the Bible says that the dead stand before God. Well, allow me to tell you, first of all, that the dead who stand before God after the second coming are not the righteous dead, because the righteous dead were judged before Jesus came. So this must be what's dead. It must be the wicked dead. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5, and I'm only going to read a portion of Revelation 20 verse 5. And the reason I'm only going to read a portion is because this is a parenthetical statement. Like if you go to the NIV, you'll notice that what I'm going to read is placed in parenthesis. In other words, it breaks the flow of thought in Revelation chapter 20. 
And so I'm only going to read this particular portion uh, because it has a very important meaning for us to understand what the Bible means when it says that the dead stand before God. Notice Revelation 20 and verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were what? Finished. Who are the rest of the dead here? They have to be the wicked. Because the previous verse says, blessed are those who resurrect in the first resurrection. They will live, they will reign with Jesus a thousand years. So if they're going to reign with Jesus a thousand years, and they lived again at the beginning of the thousand years, it must mean that they're resurrected at the second coming of Jesus. So who are the rest of the dead that did not live again until the thousand years were finished? It must be the what? It must be the wicked dead. Now what are these wicked dead doing according to the text that we're studying? The dead, it says, were standing before whom? Before God. Now what does that mean that the dead were standing before God? Listen folks, it means the same thing as the righteous dead standing before God. How did the righteous dead stand before God? The record of their lives were examined. You see God has in heaven an exact transcript, an exact copy of every single person on planet earth. Every word, every action, every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every decision, God has an exact transcript in heaven of the life of the person. That's why when we appear before the great judgment seat of Christ, the Bible says that what is going to be examined is what we did in the body, whether it was good or whether it was what? Or whether it was evil. So before the second coming, the righteous dead appear before the throne of God. They're dead, but they're appearing through their what? Through their records. So the question is, how do the wicked dead appear before God during the thousand years? If they don't live again until the thousand years are finished, that must mean that they must appear before the judgment seat of Christ being already what? Dead. But do they appear there in person? Do dead people appear before the throne of God in person? Absolutely not. They appear through their records. Are you with me? In fact the text says so. It says, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. What is examined? What is written in the books? It's not the dead who are there, it's the record of the life of the dead. Are you clear on this point? Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and I'll show you that those who resurrected when Jesus came are actually going to participate in that judgment. They're going to examine the lives of the wicked and the lives of the devil and his angels. And they're going to mete out the punishment. You say, where does the Bible teach this? Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Now who is the them referred to here? Well, continue saying, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. We're going to talk about the souls under the altar in our next topic tomorrow. So we won't get into this now. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they what? They lived, which means that they were what? Dead. Of course, if they were beheaded, they were dead, right? And so it says, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Who are those? The righteous or the wicked? The righteous. What are they going to do for a thousand years? They're going to reign with Jesus. What else are they going to do? It says judgment was committed to them. They are going to judge. The question is, who are they going to judge? Think they're going to judge the righteous? No, because the, ju the judgment of the righteous took place before Jesus came, and they're already in heaven. They don't need any judgment. So who are they going to judge? It must be the world and Satan and his angels. You say, does the Bible teach such a thing? Yes, it does. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about members who sue members. He says, you're not supposed to take your dirty laundry before the courts of the world. It's better for you to suffer loss than to give the church a bad name. 
So it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the righteous, before the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the what? That the saints will judge the world? By the way, the word world there means the wicked. Jesus said, love not the world, nor those who are in the world. Whoever loves the world is an enemy of God. So do you not know that the saints will judge the world? That means the wicked. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In other words, if you can't resolve your little issues here on earth, what makes you think that you're going to be able to judge the world? And then notice verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that we shall judge what? Angels. I suppose that must be the good angels. It can't be the good angels. Why would the good angels need a judgment? They're in the presence of God. They don't need to be judged. So who must these angels be? They must be the devil and his angels. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the question is, how do the wicked dead stand before the throne of God while the righteous are alive in heaven? You see, the Bible says that the righteous are alive in heaven. They lived, reigned with Jesus a thousand years, and they judge. The wicked were told that they did not live again until the thousand years were finished. In between, the dead appear what? They appear before God. How? Not in person, because they're what? Because they're dead. They appear through their records. Once again, Revelation 20 and verse 12 makes this absolutely clear. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. What is examined is the record in the books. That's how the wicked stand before God. Now we need to go to another very important point. I want to share with you an expanded meaning of the word spirit. You remember that we studied previously in a lecture that the spirit represents the breath of life or the vitalizing force that God gives us so that the body can function. But what I want to say is the spirit is that, but the spirit is more. You say, what do, what do you mean the spirit is more? Once a person is given the breath of life, that person begins writing his or her personal history. Say an individual like Adam lived to be 930 years old. He wrote his history during those 930 years. Let me ask you, when Jesus resurrects Adam, is he only going to return to Adam the breath of life, or is he going to return to Adam the person that Adam was when he died? You see, he's not going to only return the breath of life, the bare breath of life, the energizing force. He has to return with the energizing force the character or the self-identity or the individuality that Adam developed during those 930 years of life. Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words, the, the, the spirit, when a person dies, the Bible says it returns to God. The spirit means the breath of life, yes, the energizing force, plus the record of the person's life will be returned to the person when the person resurrects. That is the spirit. Now, don't misunderstand. The spirit is not some invisible, some conscious entity that leaves the body at the moment of death. No. What God does is He saves the record of that person's life because when He resurrects that person, He's going to give that person the breath of life plus the record of his life that makes, for example, Adam, Adam. What would happen if God returned the breath of life to Adam and he gave him the, the personality of Jane Johnson? That wouldn't fit very well, would it? That'd be totally, totally out of character. And so, and so what God does, what he's going to do, is he's going to return to the person who resurrects the breath of life and the record of their lives which is contained in the heavenly records. 
Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 on this point. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Speaking about the process of death, it says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Do you know what God saves in heaven when a person dies? God doesn't go around saving their breath. I think I'll save his breath. I think I'll save her breath. No, because God can give the energizing force. The energizing force is the same for everybody. But the written record of, their, of the life of each person is different for each person. And so when God returns the breath of life, He returns the self-identity along with the breath to that person. So what is it that God is saving in heaven when a person dies? What God saves is the record of that person's life. In other words, He saves that person's character, if you please. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. We already read this verse, let's read it again. It says, therefore, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or whether evil. In other words, during the judgment, what God does is He examines the record of our life, which is the preservation of the Spirit, if you please, the preservation of the record of our life, what we were like when we lived. Now, you know the Bible speaks about books, and the Bible also speaks about a book. Did you notice that in Revelation 20 and verse 12? Now what is it that the book contains? Singular. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about several of his fellow laborers, and he says this, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. What is it that the book of life contains? The book of life contains names according to this book, singular. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. And there's many verses that I could, um, that I could read, but I'm only going to read two because of, of time constraints. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Here Jesus speaks and He says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out His what? His name from the book of life, but I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. What is it that Jesus is going to present before the Father? Is it the person in a living state, or is it the name of the person that He presents in the judgment? It is His or her name according to Scripture. So what is it that the book contains? The book contains names. And by the way, those names are in the book in chronological order. Beginning with the first person who lived on planet Earth, Adam, all the way till the end of history, all of the names in that book are found in chronological order, in the order of birth. Now you're saying, what do the books contain? Plural. See, the books don't contain the names, the book contains the name. Uh, what is it that the books contain? The fact is, folks, that the books, according to the Bible, contain the record of our life. All of our actions, all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our feelings, all of our emotions. In other words, God keeps in heaven an exact transcript of our life while we lived on planet Earth from the time of our conception till the time of our death. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? You know, the Bible speaks about books because that's the best thing that the authors could come up with, with back then because records were kept in scrolls. You know, Ellen White spoke about photography. She said, God is photographing our lives. And so God has pictures up there. I believe that if God were speaking today, if He had another inspired prophet that would write books of the Bible, God would speak in terms not of books or in terms of photography, He would speak in terms of computers. In fact, I'm going to give you an illustration from the computer in a few moments. Now allow me to read you a few verses from the Bible that speak about the Spirit in this expanded meaning. You're understanding that I'm not saying that the Spirit is conscious, right? that the Spirit lives somewhere in the netherworld when the person dies? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the Spirit is simply the record of the life that God preserves and keeps until the resurrection when He returns that. Is that clear? 
I want to make it absolutely clear because I don't want anybody saying, oh, Pastor Moore said there's, there's an expanded meaning of the word spirit and he believes that God has a spirit in heaven and the real person is on earth. No. What I'm saying is that the person is writing their history on earth and God is transcribing it in heaven. In other words, in heaven there's another Steve Bohr in written form. Now, let's notice a few texts that speak about the word spirit. Luke 8 and verse 55. And by the way, uh, you know I use large print because I usually have to use glasses in order to read. Uh, so if I read something wrong, you make sure to correct me, okay? Uh, Luke 8 verse 55. Speaking about a little girl that Jesus resurrected, and it says there, then, are you there? In Luke 8 verse 55, then the Spirit returned and she arose immediately. Is that what the text says? The Spirit returned? No. It says then her Spirit returned. That's a possessive pronoun by the way. And she arose immediately and He commanded that she be given something to eat. Let me ask you, when that little girl resurrected, was it the same little girl that had died? Did God return to her with the breath of life what that little girl had been during her lifetime? Do you think that she recognized her parents? The Bible even gives us the impression that she was hungry. And so when she died, she was hungry. And when she woke up, the, the people said, well, she's hungry, let's give her some food. In other words, she picked up, uh, picked up where she what? Where she left off. What did Jesus do when He resurrected her? He returned not only the breath of life, but He returned to her who she had been during her life. Her spirit, in other words. Are you with me? Now let's go to Acts 7, 59 and 60. This is speaking about Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Acts 7, verses 59 and 60. It says there, And they stoned Stephen, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive the Spirit. That doesn't say receive the Spirit. It says receive what? My Spirit. Why does he say receive my spirit? What is Stephen saying? Stephen is saying, Lord, please save the record of my life because someday after I sleep you're going to wake me up. Preserve my spirit. Preserve the record of my life. Verse 60, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he what? He fell asleep. I love that, he fell asleep. Let's read about Jesus. Luke 23 and verse 46. Luke 23 and verse 46. This is about the death of Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, into your hands I commend the Spirit. That's not what He says. He says, into your hands I commend what? My Spirit. And having said this, he what? He breathed his last. When Jesus resurrected on resurrection morning, uh, did he recognize the disciples? Do you think he did? Of course he did. Uh, did Jesus remember everything that had happened during his lifetime? Of course he did. Did Jesus uh, remember every little detail of what his disciples had spoken to him during his life? Of course. What did God return to Jesus? What was returned to Jesus was not only the capacity to breathe, but the record of the life of Jesus which had been preserved by the Father. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, save the record of my life. Save me up there in written form. When He was resurrected, the record of His life was inputted into His resurrected body, and it was Jesus who resurrected. Now, I want you to notice a very interesting passage that we find in the writings of Ellen White. The little old lady caught this that I'm sharing with you. She had only two and a half years of primary education, but she had divine wisdom. Listen to the way she explains the expanded meaning of the word spirit. This is found in the Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 6, pages 1092 and 1093. Our personal identity 
is preserved in the resurrection. Though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. God doesn't have to rescue every little particle of matter that we were composed of when we died, because the body is going to be much larger. He's going to need more matter than what we have now. She continues saying, the wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. And here comes the key portion. The spirit, the character of man, is returned to God there to be preserved. What is it that's preserved? Our what? Our character. She says, in the resurrection, every man will have his own character. Why? Because God did what? God saved it in heaven. He saved the record. And when Jesus comes to resurrect His people, and if, you know, let's not use me as an example, because I want to be alive when Jesus comes, but, you know, let's say Stephen, when Stephen is resurrected, is his self-identity, his individuality, his personality returned to him as when he was alive? Absolutely. She continues saying, in the resurrection every man will have his own character. God in his own time will call forth the dead, giving again the breath of life, and bidding the dry bones live. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again, bearing the same individuality of features, so that friend will recognize friend. Yes, I will recognize Maggie. And I believe that probably Maggie will be alive, so we'll say that she'll be translated from among the living. And so it says here, there is no law of God in nature which shows that God gives back the same identical particles of matter which compose the body before death. God shall give the righteous dead a body that will please Him. So what is the spirit? The spirit is the character or the self-identity of the individual that is returned. By the way, this explains the reason why Job said what he did. You know, when I, when I read uh, Job 19 verses 25 to 27, and I'm going to read it from the King James because it's more forceful there. When I read it I said, man this guy's pretty selfish. He uses my and I as if nobody else is going to resurrect. Notice what he says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. So Job is the only one that's going to see Jesus when Jesus comes. He says, it will be my eyes and none other. What is Job saying? He's saying that when I resurrect, it is going to be Job, the Job who lived over in the Middle East, my own eyes that I had while I was alive, in the human body, he says, at that time I am going to see Jesus. In other words, it's going to be the same Job that will see Jesus. Now let's talk about after the millennium. You understanding how the dead stand before God now? The wicked dead stand before God through their records during the millennium? But now let's talk about after the millennium. Let me ask you, do the wicked resurrect wicked after the millennium? Or do they resurrect righteous? They resurrect wicked. What does God return to them? They've been dead a thousand years, some of them more than a thousand years. What does God return to the wicked? Say for example Nero, what will he return to Nero? When Nero resurrects, will he be Nero? Will he remember the days when, when he was the emperor? of the Roman Empire. Of course, will he remember every, all of the evil things that he did? Of course, he will pick up where he left off. Now notice this statement that we find in Great Controversy, page 664. This is an amazing statement. She's speaking about the wicked outside the holy city after they've been resurrected. She says, there are kings and generals who conquered nations, valiant men who never lost a battle, proud ambitious warriors whose approach made kingdoms tremble. In death, these experienced no change. And here comes the key portion. As they come up from the grave, they resume the current of their thoughts just where it ceased. By the way, current means electricity. So what happens when the wicked resurrect? They pick up in the exact place where they what? 
where they left off. So what is returned to the wicked? What is returned to the wicked is the breath of life and the record of their lives. And that's why they resurrect wicked, and that's why the righteous resurrect how? Righteous. And during the millennium, what are God's people going to do? They are going to be examining the cases of the wicked to decide what reward or what punishment they deserve after the thousand years. Are you following me or not? Now let me give you an illustration. Suppose I have a video camera, and I film certain things now in uh, 2007, November of 2007, I'm filming several things, and then I decide to put the camera away for a very extended period of time. Say I put the camera away for 12 years. You know, I shut it off. 12 years later, I take the camera and I begin videotaping again. When you watch the videotape, do you know that there have been 12 years between the first thing that you filmed and the second thing that you filmed? No. Because the tape picks up at the exact moment where you what? Where you left off. That is the case of the righteous and the wicked. You see, when we die, what happens? The video camera is turned off because God has, doesn't have to register anything more. See, we're not living in our present sinful state. But then, say with the wicked, after a thousand years that the video camera is off, then God resurrects them, and the video camera begins what? Begins taping again. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So what happens during the interim? During the interim, nothing happens. The people who are dead simply remain dead. They're not writing anything in their personal biography. Are you with me? Now, let's go and examine another phrase, and we're going to have to go quickly on this one. Examine another phrase which has confused many people. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. It's related to what we've been studying. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Here the Apostle Paul, whom I believe to be the author of the book of Hebrews, says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. He's saying that God's people have come to where? To Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem? Don't we live on earth? Don't we live in Fresno? Of course we live in Fresno. So in what sense have we come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem? Let's continue reading. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are what? What's the next word? Who are what? Registered or written in heaven. So how are we, how are we at, in Zion or in the heavenly Jerusalem? Are we there personally? No. We are there how? In written form. And then it says, To God, the judge of all, and here comes the uh, confusing phrase, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. But we come by faith. We don't come in person. And it says, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So you'll notice here that in the heavenly Jerusalem, written there, are the spirits of just men made perfect. You say, now wait a minute. Were they imperfect before? Let's examine other texts in the book of Hebrews that use the word perfect. If we understand the meaning of the word perfect, we're going to understand what the text means when it says, spirits of just men made perfect. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 39 and 40. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Speaking about the heroes of the Old Testament, it says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. That is the promise of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God, having provided something better for us, in other words, God has provided something better for us than for all of those Old Testament heroes, and it says that they should not be made what? 
perfect apart from us. Is there something special for those who live in the times when Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died on the cross that we have an advantage over those who lived in the Old Testament period? Yes, the Bible says that they were not made perfect without what? Without us. Now what does that mean, they were not made perfect without us? Go with me to Hebrews 7 and verse 19. Hebrews 7 and verse 19. It's going to speak about this Old Testament period, the inadequacy of the Old Testament period. It says in Hebrews 7 verse 19, For the law made nothing what? Perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a what? A better hope through which we draw near to God. Let me ask you, did the Old Testament system really eradicate sin? Did the blood of bulls and goats take away sin? from the heavenly records. No. What is it that takes away sin? What takes away sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. All of those Old Testament heroes, had Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood yet? No. They without us could not be made what? Could not be made perfect. In other words, their records in heaven could not be cleansed until Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Notice Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Hebrews 10 and verse 1, it says, For the law, that's speaking about the Old Testament period, having a shadow of good things to come. What was the Old Testament system? It was what? It wasn't the reality. It was a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach what? Perfect. Could the Old Testament sacrifices make a person perfect? We're not talking about moral perfection here. We're talking about someone who'd keep, who could be accepted before God through the perfect life and the death of Jesus. You know, none of us can appear before God in ourselves because we're sinners. But we needed the perfect life of Jesus and the death of Jesus so that now He can go to heaven and He can represent us. We have a better hope, in other words, than the Old Testament saints. We have been made perfect through Jesus Christ, through His perfect life and through His death on the cross. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Could those individuals who were written in heaven really have had their sins blotted out and forgiven unless Jesus had come to die. Could they have been made perfect in terms of being saved? Absolutely not. Now notice Hebrews 10 and verse 14. It says, For by one offering He has perfected forever those who are being what? Those who are being sanctified. Are you understanding what the Bible means when it says spirits of just men made perfect? What it means is that all of those people who died in the Old Testament, they had these records in heaven. Their spirit was registered in heaven. The record of their lives was in heaven. But all of their sins, unless Jesus died, what would happen? They would be held against them because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, let me ask you, were they perfected in terms of all of their sins now legally been being forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross? Absolutely. So that's what spirits of just men made perfect means. It doesn't mean that there's some unconscious immortal spirit roaming around heaven. It simply means that the records, which we've already noticed, the word spirit means the character or the record of the life. The record of the life is now made clean through the blood of Jesus which could not happen in the Old Testament because Jesus had not yet shed His blood. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now, let me give you an illustration in closing. We have computers. And I think if God had been spo speaking today about uh, this issue that we're discussing, He would have used computers. You know, you have the computer, which is a physical uh, machine. You plug it in, and now it what? And now it has energy to work, right? But when you buy the computer at a store, that computer does not have its own self-identity. Does not have, you know, you go to the store and you buy a certain computer, everybody gets the same computer, right? But then you start inputting information, and that computer becomes your own PC, your personal computer. Because you're now inputting things that gives that computer its own what? Its own identity. Let me ask you, a year later, are any of those computers the same? They're totally different. But let me ask you, is the energy source the same? 
The energy source is the same, but what was inputted is what? Is different. It becomes your personal computer. Now, there's always danger that your computer at some point would be what? Would crash. Or would be destroyed. So what do intelligent people do? Intelligent people, they save on disks backups to everything that you have in the computer. In other words, you save the identity of the computer in those CDs. Are you understanding? And therefore if someday the computer crashes and it disintegrates, if the ceiling falls and it's broken into smithereens, the person who owned the computer can say, not a problem. So he goes and buys another computer at the store. Let me ask you, can that person take that computer that he bought at the store and input the information that was on the first, first computer and give this new computer the same identity that the first computer had? Absolutely. That's exactly what God does in heaven. As I live, God saves a backup. Because he knows that someday this computer is going to crash. He knows that someday, unless Jesus comes while I'm alive, which will be the very end time generation, He knows that we're going to die and we're going to disintegrate. So God says, I'm going to save a backup in heaven. I'm going to save the disks in heaven, in other words He says, because I know that someday I'm going to have to give this person a new computer, I'm going to have to plug that computer in, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the record of their lives and I'm going to input the record of their lives into the resurrected, immortal, and incorruptible body, and they will be the same persons that they were while they were alive. Are you understanding now what God saves in heaven? He saves the record of our lives. The righteous do not appear in person if they died. The wicked do not appear in person if they died. The dead appear before God through the record of their lives. By the way, do you know that after the millennium the wicked are going to resurrect and they will once again see all of the records? They're going to see them. See, we'll see them during the thousand years. After the thousand years, the books are going to be open and the wicked are going to see it. Let me read this verse in closing. Revelation 20, verse 13, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. This is speaking about the resurrection. And they were judged, each one according to his works. See, the wicked are going to be alive. They're going to resurrect, and they're going to see the record of their lives. And then the beautiful thing is that God is going to cast them into the lake of fire, the devil and his angels and the wicked, and then the Bible tells us that He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Those who were not found written in the book of life will be stricken from the book of life and they will be destroyed in the lake of fire. How important is it then to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord? Folks, it is a matter of life and death.